Um, well, most of you probably know, but I'll just give you a short presentation of, of EBA. Um, EBA is um, the expert group uh, for ACE studies, and it's a government committee established in 2013 uh, and tasked with uh, providing uh, analysis and evaluation of uh, Swedish uh, development aid. Uh, the expert group uh, consists of 10 members, uh, each uh, they are in a personal but professional capacity and its work is supported by a secretariat with a staff of seven persons um, who help us uh, to commission studies, uh, to um, publish them and also to organize seminars like this one. Um, in addition, I'd like to say that, um, well, one of, of the ambitions of, of EBA is to act as a link uh, between research, the research community, and, um, and development uh, policy, policy making. And I think this is where also this seminar uh, will place itself. Uh, well, as you know, I mean, we will discuss sort of the opportunities and limitations uh, in using geocoded aid data uh, as a resource for Swedish development cooperation. Uh, but we will see also examples from other areas uh, and other fields uh, to give us a sense of how you can actually use uh, geocoded data uh, to improve knowledge and also to increase uh, action and uh, to support uh, the persons uh, most in need. Uh, the program will be as follows. Um, Anne Sophie Saxon, um, oh, I should have had a report. <laughs> uh, is um, uh, has um, written a, a report for, for Eva, and she will start by giving an introduction and, and presenting uh, uh, her main uh, well findings and arguments uh, uh, for using Duke coded data in Swedish development cooperation. Um, we will then have um, a very interesting uh, presentation of how geocoded data uh, can be used uh, to link uh, persons in dire need uh, with persons who want to help. Uh, it's a case study, in a sense, from Somalia, and we're very happy uh, that you're here to be able to do that. Uh, and um, lastly, we'll have uh, a presentation from, uh, from uh, A-Data, uh, with, um, that will um, present how also um, geospatial data can be used uh, to analyze uh, inequalities and how you can better focus uh, aid uh, using, um, uh, using this type of data. Um, afterwards, we'll have a panel of two persons who will comment on these three presentations. Um, and we will also be served lunch, um, so there will be, we'll make just a very short break here for you to grab, grab a salad and, and, uh, and a sandwich. And then we'll continue with, with of course, the, the, the panel discussion, and we also hope on your active uh, participation. So, without uh, further ado, um, I'll uh, let Anne-Sophie uh, give you a presentation. So, welcome. <laughs> Okay, so you can hear me, right? Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for organizing this and allowing me to get the opportunity to pre present for this, for this audience. I, I'm guessing you have a lot of insights that are not quite possible to get from the academic side. So thanks to Sida and Iba for, for organizing this. And as uh, Eva was uh, saying, uh, the reason that I'm uh, here today is that I'm, I've written this report during the spring and we're launching it formally, perhaps, uh, today. And if you're interested, I think there should be a few copies over by the door there. Um, 
So first of all, then, what, what do we mean by geospatial analysis of aid? Um, well, as the name kind of um, implies, it uses geographic information, both on project location and also on you know, the relevant uh, outcomes and covariates that we might be interested in looking at. So when we speak of geocoded project data, it's, it's simply information on where a project is, uh, is implemented, has been implemented. So it could be one or many locations, depending on the type of project. Um, so to take like a very concrete example, if, uh, if you have a development project uh, building schools, it would be, you know, the coordinates of, of these schools would be the relevant uh, geocoded information. Or if you have, say, you know, a, a, a project uh, covering 20 villages in, in Tanzania, it would be the geocodes of these particular villages. So, so in these uh, simple examples, um, you have like very um, clearly defined project sites, and then you can get quite, uh, quite uh, specific geocodes uh, for that. Um, but this, of course, does not apply to, to all types of, uh, of projects. You could, for instance, have, say, a local government uh, project implemented at the district, district level, and then you would have less precise geocodes at the district level specifying in which particular districts this, this policy is being implemented. And for other types of projects, it's, it's realized that at even more aggregate level, so at the province level, perhaps, or even at the national level. So you think, think for example, of, uh, of budget support or, or sector support and so on. And, and in, in those cases, you don't get very informative geocodes, obviously. So, so um, the precision of the geocodes that you get depends on the types of projects that we're interested in, we're looking at. And um, obviously, then, geospatial analysis is more relevant in the top examples here than in the bottom, like where you have more specific geocodes and well-defined project sites. Um, and when we speak of geocoded outcome data, then this is to simply to have um, geographic information on relevant outcomes or covariates that we're interested in looking at. So it could, for instance, be that we have um, information on where survey respondents um, live so that we can connect them to specific project sites, identify survey respondents living close to and further away from, from, from specific project sites. So if we combine these sources of data, so both data on where projects are localized and uh, uh, relevant data on outcome and covariates. You can uh, assess systematic patterns in, in, uh, in aid allocation and, in, in, uh, and assess also aid impacts systematically and on a wide scale, uh, potentially across um, several countries if, if, you, if you want to do that. Um, so this is just... Um, this is just to show you how you can combine uh, combine uh, geocoded outcome and um, and project data. It's from uh, one of my own research projects. Um, so here are the green points show you the coverage of the Afrobarometer survey, and the reds show you geocoded uh, Chinese aid project sites. And in this particular project, we looked at experiences with corruption. So what we did was that we identified um, survey clusters close to, to these uh, Chinese aid project sites and looked at uh, experiences with corruption in connection to, to these uh, project sites. And I'm not going to go into the details more about this project, just to show you that, you know, how you can combine, combine the data across several, several countries simultaneously and look at project impact. Um, so, in the last few years, there's been a rapid increase in the availability of uh, geocoded data. And this is uh, not only on, uh, on uh, the project side, but also on, on, in terms of uh, covariates and, and, and uh, relevant outcomes. So, when it comes to um, geocoded data on, on development projects, it's much thanks to A-Data, which I guess you will learn more about in a second from Ariel. 
they have compiled a lot of, also geocoded themselves and compiled a lot of uh, data on, on uh, development projects. And uh, now the World Bank, for instance, routinely geocode all their projects. And also the African Development Bank and the Asian Development Bank do so on, on a large scale. Um, A-Data has geocoded Chinese aid projects, uh, which is the data that I used in, this, uh, in, the, in the project I just referred to. Um, and also some, um, some aid receiving countries themselves geocode incoming aid flows. So you can also get data from that side. Um, and in terms of, of uh, results that we might be interested in, in looking at, there's an increased availability of um, geocoded households and individual survey data. So for instance, the Afrobarometer survey that I just mentioned, that covers a lot of countries and a lot of issues over you know, many years. And also the likes of um, the, de um, the Demographics and Health Survey, also covering a lot of countries over many years. Uh, the World Bank's Living Standards Survey as well, just to mention a couple of examples. And uh, there have also been improvements in technology um, that have given an increased availability of detailed geocoded data from, say, satellite images and from using mobile phones and internet and credit cards, and you can get information on consumption patterns and, and demographics and, and, and so on. So, uh, due to this surge in, in um, geocoded data, there's been an increase in the number of studies utilizing this type, types of materials. So, it's an interesting development, I would say. Um, so, what types of questions could we answer using, uh, using geocoded data? And uh, here you could both uh, look at systematic allocation patterns, so the distribution of aid within countries, and also assessing project impacts. Uh, so in terms of uh, aid allocation patterns, um, by having a clear picture of where aid end up within countries, you could highlight inequalities in the local aid distribution. And um, by connecting this, this data to you know, the pre-existing characteristics of the localities receiving aid, you can highlight systematic um, patterns in the aid allocation. So, for instance, does aid end up where it's most needed? Is, I guess, the basic question to, to answer. Uh, do the aid flows reach the poorest areas within countries? Um, or if you look at specific uh, aid interventions, say health interventions, um, do they reach the areas where, where these health needs are the greatest? So, for instance, if you look at, you know, um, some kind of malaria uh, intervention, does it go to the areas within countries where the malaria prevalence, prevalence is, is highest, for instance? So this is, of course, useful. Um, in, in terms of impacts, um, it enables you to look at the intended consequences of aid, so you could look at health outcomes, for example, and compare them with, um, you know, over time in a specific localities um, to, to health projects covering these areas. But you could also look at unintended consequences, uh, and these might be positive as well as negative. Um, so, you know, the negative side effects could be like the paper I was referring to before, you know, looking at local corruption effects following perhaps from the inflow of, of, of aid money in the local areas. Or it could be positive spillovers like maybe a vaccination program also increases um, school attendance on kids or something like that. So it could be both intended and unintended consequences of AIDS you can look into. So these are just some examples of the things you could, could look at using this, this type of data. Um, and um, in terms of using this data for impact evaluation, um, geospatial analysis has a number of advantages. Um, basically, uh, it's not always feasible to conduct a randomized controlled trial 
it's expensive and uh, you know it's been criticized for you know to what extent you can generalize from the findings of looking at project impact of a, of a particular single project and in this case it might be a good idea to to look at um, aid interventions on a wider scale potentially as I said across across several countries um, and here, um, geospatial data has the advantage that you, since you have local information on both where projects are implemented and, uh, and um, relevant outcomes and covariates in these areas, you can control for confounding factors at the local level and try to find comparable groups of people affected and not affected by, by aid projects. So that's the, uh, I guess, the... Uh, uh, what characterizes these uh, quasi-experimental methods that we're referring to here. Um, also, since, since, uh, since you can look at the impact of a multitude of development projects at once, the local effects of, of a multitude of projects, uh, it's quite strong in terms of generalizability if you compare to RCTs of, of like particular projects. Um, and also the outcome data that you use often covers long periods of time. So you can both, both in a spatial sense and in, in a, like across time, it's easier to, to, to get a sense of uh, long-term effects. Um, and last but perhaps not least, in I guess this type, this type of audience, also that it could be relatively cost-effective to, to use these type of evaluation, evaluation methods since there is quite a lot of um, publicly available uh, existing data materials and outcomes that you can utilize. Um, um, so, uh, I'm not going to try to oversell this because there are, of course, of course, also limitations of the approach. Um, as I've already mentioned, it's it's not appropriate for all types of uh, development projects to be able to to geocode a project in a meaningful meaningful way. You need a, a physical project site or a well-defined project site. Uh, and all types of projects don't have that, obviously. Um, some projects are implemented at more aggregate level, say the province level or even the national level. Again, you can think of sector and budget support, for instance. Um, and you should also bear in mind when you use this data that there are gaps in the existing data. Um, not all donors. It's perhaps a bit of an understatement, but most donors, I guess, do not routinely geocode their date, uh, their aid, uh, at this point. So it can be difficult to get a full picture of, of the amount of, uh, of the number of projects in a particular area. And even if they geocode their aid, perhaps all all the information is not in there on timing of projects and so on. So so this needs to be kept on, kept in mind. Um, and also the questions that you can address is, is limited to, to what's in the outcome data that is available, to the survey data, to the satellite data, and so on. So if you don't want to collect any additional information, you're restricted to use, to use that type of, to the types of outcomes that you can look at with that data. Um, but that said, though, I think there are still clear benefits of geocoding aid. Uh, it's not relevant for all types of aid projects, but for the projects where it is relevant, it's a valuable tool for to, to evaluate aid allocation patterns and, and aid impacts. And on top of these um, benefits in terms of aid evaluation, I think there's um, um, important benefits in terms of aid management and, and planning and a dialogue between development partners if you have a clear picture of where aid is located within within countries. If you highlight financing gaps, it can help the partner country government to, to, to steer aid towards the areas where, where it's most needed and where it should thus be most effective, I guess. It could also simplify donor coordination. If you, if you detect that there's you know, wasteful project duplication in certain areas and a lack of financing in other areas. Um, it also has important... Um, I think benefits in terms of transparency and accountability, especially since this data tends to be publicly available. So, 
citizens, perhaps not citizens themselves, but through media, researchers, auditors, or, or, or what have you, um, could uh, verify that pro projects are actually being implemented where they are intended to be implemented and, and to see if there are any results in the, in the, over the longer term. And also by geocoding aid, and I think this is an important point, you, you contribute to the public good um, that this um, publicly available data constitutes. So anyone can use this data. It could be students, the researchers, the media, uh, the governments of partner countries, the donor agencies themselves, and so on. Um, so turning to, to the potential for geospatial analysis of Swedish aid, um, as you are aware, um, Swedish aid is not yet uh, geocoded on a wide scale. Um, so this, to, to be able to um, uh, make use of geospatial data, you would have to, you know, need some, uh, some efforts in terms of geocoding. And here I think a reasonable first step is to actually screen what data is already out there. And um, uh, this is relevant because, as I said, some um, um, partner countries already geocode incoming aid flows themselves. And also, since we, Sweden tend to co-fund projects uh, with many other donors that might themselves geocode aid, such as the World Bank, you could get probably useful information from them if you're interested to get the full picture of where aid, the, the funds are going. And if, if deciding to um, proceeding with geocoding from that, there are different options. Um, they are not mutually exclusive, you can do a combination. Um, you could hire coders to, to do like a broad geocoding of the, of the entire portfolio, um, or the relevant parts of the portfolio. Or you could choose to focus on, on, a, on, a, on particular projects of interest on a more detailed level. Or you could also support partner country initiatives to, to geocode aid themselves. So, or a combination of, of these three then. Um, you know, just having a quick look at the structure of, uh, of, uh, of the Swedish aid in 2016 from OpenAid, um, you can see, you know, quickly that uh, some of these sect in some, some of these sectors, uh, maybe it's not feasible or very useful to, to try to geocode aid. Refugees in donor countries, for example, concerns activities in, in Sweden, it's not very relevant. The unallocated, unspecified charities um, sector is uh, a lot of non-earmarked um, funds, which are of course difficult to, f uh, to follow. But, you know, then again, for, for other sectors such as uh, democracy, human rights, humanitarian aid and so on, there are likely to be uh, relevant candidates for, for geocoding. So you have to screen kind of the aid portfolio to see, to see what's, uh, what's relevant. Uh, in, in the report, I... I just uh, quickly mentioned the Tanzanian example. Here, the, um, the largest sector in 2016 was multi-sector aid. And it can seem kind of, you know, diffuse when you look at it. How can you follow this? But when you actually dig into the activities on open aid, um, uh, you, you find that... Um, I should have a look in here to not say anything incorrectly. Um, out of these 44 million, um, 36, 36 million goes to um, one particular project. It's 24 activities in, in this. Out of these uh, 44 million, there are tw uh, 24 activities. And uh, the absolutely biggest one is the Productive Social Safe Safety Net program, which is a um, nationwide program. Um, and OpenAid provides a lot of useful information about this. You know, the implementing agencies involved, the other donors involved and so on, but it doesn't say anything about the, uh, about the uh, geographic locations. So, but if you, if you just do a quick online search, you can actually find that this information should be available. So from, from the World Bank and from the National, uh, Tanzania's National Institute of Statistics, uh, you get that it's been rolled out in, in five different stages, and they also refer to 161 project areas and specific villages and, and communities covered. So, so it should be able to, um, to get the geographic uh, data, uh, even for you know, a massive nationwide project such as this one. So, um, yeah, in sum, um, 
Geospatial analysis is clearly not relevant for all aid, but for the projects with, uh, with well-defined project sites, it is a valuable tool, I think, uh, for, to study aid allocation patterns and impacts. Uh, and with this rapid increase in the data that is available, um, it gives you great opportunities for, for cost-effective evaluation. That would be kind of a shame not to take advantage of, perhaps. Um, and it also has, you know, I think, benefits in terms of aid management, planning, um, dialogue between development partners. Um, but, you know, in order to, 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 um, to reap these benefits, some efforts would be needed then in terms of geocoding. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much uh, for this run through. Um, so, and you give sort of a balanced account of sort of the advantages and disadvantages and, and the successes. Um, well, I, I was going to ask you a question, but I think for, 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 for the sake of time, yeah. uh, I think we'll go on to the next uh, presentation. So, I'm very happy to introduce uh, Mohammed Osman, uh, who will present uh, a project he carried out in, in Somalia. Um, trying sort of mapping uh, needs with willing donors. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, just to gain time, please. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Mohamed Osman. I am uh, one of the uh, co-founders of Abara platform. Uh, before I start, I will give you a brief situation about the situation in Somalia during that time. When we started was in March, but uh, the reports that were coming uh, in February was suggesting that uh, 6.5 million of uh, Somali people could uh, were, were facing lack of uh, food and water. So in, in, the, in the end of February, there were coming reports that were showing through media or social media that we where you could see animals who were dying and uh, people who were at the age of uh, hunger. So uh, in that outcome, me and uh, four of our friends were get together and thought, how could we support? We Five of us have background. We are all originally from Somalia, but uh, live here in Sweden. Or one, some of our, our parents were from Somalia. So we said, how could we support? And then uh, the normal way where people were supporting was uh, fundraising and then uh, sending money back to Somalia through international organization or uh, families and others. So instead, uh, we said, and we saw early at that point, we saw there were lack of uh, information where uh, how the situation looked like in Somalia. So that's why we came up with the platform Abaraha. We started, our first meeting was uh, 10 of March. After one week, I think we have the prototype. As they, we needed to come up with something quick, and then we didn't have time to start on developing. So we used as engine Ushahidi platform, and then build it up our process and our idea, what we want to do. Uh, and this is what we came up, Abaraha which means drought in Somalia, is the first ever crisis mapping platform built for Somalia. Uh, we launched in March 2017. The platform provides relief responders with the information that allows them to connect with the drought victims so they can re-end the aid faster and more efficiently. The platform enables relief organizations to visualize where and what type of urgent needs are in, needed in the country, it enables also the relief organization to plan and respond more efficiently. Uh, the project is run uh, with uh, voluntary. There is no organization uh, others who are behind it. It was only five of friends who come together. And uh, as you know, uh, what we uh, so quick uh, soon I will show you the platform I'll demo. Um, the uh, internet is not that fast in Somalia, so at the early stage we knew that we want to collect data through uh, so some way people could call and send their reports. That's why we asked friends down there if they could set up a call center so people could call and uh, 
report the need. So now I will show you quick. So uh, this is the platform. It's a website where people either could go to the website and uh, choose one of the f uh, five uh, survey to send information. So the first one was the need and then uh, the death because, because the situation uh, people were dying of the lack of water or food. And then uh, if there was a relief organization in place, that's the Greens, the already organization in place so people could contact them and uh, send money or uh, aid. And then uh, because of the lack of food, so people were moving from their home and uh, to the cities, so that's why they're becoming IDPs who are starting up. So, and then, uh, so that's the f five we started with. So if I quick open one of the reports, it, it looks like this, it could look like this then. So just people fill in, uh, they could fill in Somali or English and often we uh, translate it to English because the, every report we are getting, we were sending further to the, those who could respond. And uh, at the early stage, we get contact with uh, OCHA, uh, UN OCHA, with uh, have the, uh, the, there are those who coordinate the aid in Somalia. So uh, at the early stage, so every information we get, we could uh, resend them to them so they can respond to it. That's the, the need. And then if you see the white dots, that means uh, people are provided uh, aid. So this, uh, I think, uh, someone who provided water. And then uh, the green was the, excuse me. It's always amazing to use. Uh, if I take uh, quick. So these are different type of volunteers who are out and reporting to the drought victims. So this is uh, how they could report. So this was important as well for them because they found raised a lot of money so the, this way they could show what the money, money went. Um, and then the death as well. So this means three, three people are died, the lack of uh, water or... Uh, so that's, uh, let me quick take. Uh, I'm sorry for rushing, I, I just got 10 minutes, that's why. <laughs> Uh, as I mentioned, everything was uh, through volunteers, so we were sitting, and every one of us had daily walks, so we were walking eight hours a day, and then in the middle of the day, and uh, the nights we were sitting, and then doing all this stuff, that we have calls with the other volunteers in the uh, USA, so we would see like uh, 2300 Swedish time, and have, because that was their time, they would just woke up, and then we will do that up to two or three o'clock and then get some sleep and work. So that was uh, our daily basis in four, four months, I think. But the lack of uh, uh, the, the rainy season started at the end of uh, August. So the situation got much better. So, so that's why we could uh, take one step back and then uh, to see what we have done in this time and then focus to the next step. How could we improve what we started and how we could maintain it. So that's the, our aim of the... During this time, there was a lot of success. One thing was uh, actually transparency. There was uh, one hospital uh, staff had reported uh, there was lack of medicine. And then we were contacted of uh, the managers of those hospitals saying, uh, where did you get this information? It's not true. And then we double checked and it showed that uh, the information was accurate. But the, the thing is, uh, this uh, hospital have got aid through international organization who contacted them asking, how can you have can be lack of medicine where we uh, delivered to you for one week earlier? So there was this type of discussion we could have. Uh, let me see. 
And this is a new way of conducting humanitarian aid. Instead, uh, in early stage, we have uh, got contact with the, through uh, Ben Stiller Foundation uh, group of uh, Love Army, they call themselves. So they collected within 24 hours uh, 2.5 million US dollar. So what they wanted when we were discussing is like, we provide the information, they provide the money, and then people volunteer in the, in the, on the ground could uh, uh, respond to it and deliver the aid. So that's one of our idea. We're still discussing the idea. I think maybe it will be next. Uh, uh, I think through that time, oh, time is fly. Okay, <laughs> I'll straight jump to this picture. This is prediction of uh, the situation uh, uh, before, how the situation would look like. Um, if you compare to our map here, you can see how fine it fits. It's quite amazing. The stress areas with the red, and then what we re the people are reporting. And every report that comes are based through crowdsourcing. So there's no uh, organization that goes out and collects the data. So everyone who are in these areas could send the information. And after we verify the information, we publish it. So that's the simple process. And in that way, we take away the middleman or the gatekeepers. There's always in these countries uh, people, you find gatekeepers, what we call. So that's why we had the success. People could trust us. And every report had the contact details. So you never needed to contact us. You could contact straight to the, those who are in need. So that was one of positive effects. Uh, some positive outcome, we were mentioned in this area, so <laughs> it's always... And then uh, we started uh, collaboration with uh, the Somali uh, government. At that time they didn't have a uh, coordination center, no. So they contacted us and asked it, uh, if, we could, uh, if they could use us as uh, coordination at the beginning. So that was positive. And Ocha, who were the main responsible for uh, coordinating. Aid. And then back in Denmark and Yale University. Thank you. And this, uh, the team. Two of us are here as well, so that's it. I think I managed. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for this very. Well, I'm quite taken actually by, by, by this presentation um, because, I mean, it, it's really sort of about bottom-up uh, action and people trying to use um, technical means uh, to help others. I mean, it's, it, it's a simple concept and, and you wonder why aid has to be so complicated sometimes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, now our next presenter. Um, Ariel uh, ben -Yoshi. and uh, you are the chief economist from um, A-Data. And, uh, well, A-Data is called sort of a research lab. Uh, I wonder, there are all sorts of labs now. <laughs> uh, and um, I know you have been working lots of, of, on data, but also on, on uh, geospatial data and, and how to use it. And uh, I guess you will share some of your experiences uh, with us. So please, Maria. So let's give Ariel a big hand. Perfect. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Ava, and all the organizers. Um, really glad to be here. Apologize uh, that I just arrived this morning. So if I look a little glazed over, it's just the jet lag. Um, yep, so A-Data is this research lab based at the College of William & Mary in Virginia, about two hours south of Washington. Um, and we've been working on geospatial data for foreign aid uh, for about the last six years or so. Um, so I'm going to share some of the results of some studies that we've done and kind of get you a little bit behind the scenes of how we actually kind of make, make the sausage, how we geocode the, the data and, um, you know, uh, get, get you some ideas about how folks here might might want to do that as well. Uh, I should also say we've uh, just this fall released a report that's called Development Progress from the Bottom Up, um, and it really tries to kind of summarize our findings from these uh, first six years. 
So just to motivate why it's even important for us to be looking at geocoded data, um, I think Mohammed's presentation was a really cool example of it, um, and I want to take you to a kind of a much longer run version of that. Um, so some folks at uh, Stanford looked at child mortality trends from the demographic and health surveys across sub-Saharan Africa and used the GIS data that was available there to interpolate, kind of fill in the areas that the DHS didn't sample. Um, and when they did that, what they realized is that child mortality had fallen quite substantially in many parts of sub-Saharan Africa in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. And yet, often within the same countries, you would also be able to find areas where it either hadn't fallen at all or actually had increased over time, often within the same district or region of an individual country. Right? So this variation within countries was actually even larger than the variation across countries that we see, uh, at least in sub-Saharan Africa and child mortality outcomes, which tells you that where you're working really matters, right? Maybe not that crazy of an idea, but I think one that we always, um, that, we, that we often forget. Uh, so in addition to that, we wanted to say, okay, well then how much variation is there in where aid goes? Um, and we've got a bunch of different data sets that we could use to answer that question. But the first is that when you just look at things from a country perspective, so this first graph is just countries, and on the x-axis we've got GDP per capita and total aid, um, and this is, for example, from the World Bank data set that we geocoded for all IDA and IBRD projects between 95 and 2014, and you see that you know, wealthier countries get less aid from the bank. Okay. Sounds okay. But then you go within a country, say for Tanzania, and this looks like the same pattern, except on the x-axis, we've now used the poverty rate. Districts with higher poverty actually get less aid when you look within Tanzania. And that's true when we look at a variety of, country, a variety of um, countries and within them. Um, and so you have this kind of whole uh, paradigm shift when you zoom in to within country borders. And it makes us ask, is aid being allocated efficiently within countries? Um, and there's lots of evidence that we've gathered over the last six years. When you look at just these correlations, you can correlate the location of these aid uh, um, transfers to less poor and often to more densely populated areas. Donors look like they're going to places that have larger populations, um, but uh, not always to, to less poor. At least that's the correlations, right? Um, then we can try to understand what's the kind of political economy motivations of some of this. And, and many of the findings suggest that aid is being allocated within countries uh, you know, by politically astute leaders. So often, just before elections, we see a disproportionate amount of aid go to swing districts, districts that might actually change the, the election results. Um, in some cases, we see aid being allocated specifically to spur conflict. This is often uh, we've, we found evidence of this in the Philippines, for example. And then some types of aid look like they're being given disproportionately to home regions of leaders, especially certain types of leaders. You can imagine this. And then we're trying to understand not just kind of these political motivations, but also just in general, how efficient is this? Um, these correlations are all well and good, but that doesn't tell us, you know, kind of as a, as a base metric, are we doing okay or not? Um, and most of the evidence that we, that we see suggests not. So for example, when we look at whether, when countries cross the IDA threshold and become ineligible for most of the World Bank's aid, uh, we don't see that the sparser budgets that they now have get increasingly allocated to, or disproportionately allocated to poorer places or needier places in particular, which is kind of what, what most theory would predict. Um, and perhaps most importantly, we also begin to understand that some projects have disproportionate effects in places, in certain types of places. And the type of place we can really start to under, unpack by using geospatial data. So under what conditions do these aid projects really have bigger effects? We kind of think about these as heterogeneous effects, right? Effects that differ over space. And what we really want to do is pick out the conditions or the spots where aid is likely to be most effective. So that's the kind of the, the goal of targeting, if you will, right? You want to go to the spot where uh, your, your money's actually going to make the biggest difference or a difference. So all of that 
is kind of the, the prelude. And what we've been working on is basically trying to answer three different questions. So can we find these conditions under which aid is effective or especially effective? Can we learn something rigorous about already completed projects? And Sophie gave a really nice, um, I, what I think about is a very like astute theoretical explanation of what this can do. In many cases, the kinds of evaluations that you can do with geospatial aid, or sorry, geospatial data, let you go back to projects that have already been completed or uh, many years ago in some cases, right, and actually learn from them. This is a kind of learning that often isn't happening right now in the development sector. Um, and then lastly, can we bring down the costs of rigorous evaluations? Right? Can we do more evaluations with budgets that we currently have? Um, I'm not going to go over too many of the advantages because I think Anne Sophie did a really nice job of um, what we think about as geospatial impact evaluation. Um, again, cheaper and faster, that's always nice, um, can produce results with external validity, so we believe them for more locations and in more time periods. Um, we can do them for long run evaluations and retrospectively. Um, lots and lots of applications. Uh, and the application set is growing literally by the day. Uh, we can look at municipal governance projects, road and electricity infrastructure, violence prevention, lots and lots of health sector stuff, but also broader things that we might think about as kind of economic development corridors um, and land tenure projects, things that are increasingly um, also spanning lots of disciplines, right? Um, some of the partners that we've been working with, uh, you can see, include lots of U.S. agencies, but, uh, but also increasingly European ones as well. So I want to run you through a few examples um, to, to kind of give you the flavor of, of what a geospatial impact evaluation really looks like. This is a case from the West Bank and Gaza. Here's the West Bank of Palestine. And uh, the U.S. aid mission there had funded um, a series of roads, roughly 30 or, uh, or so road segments with the, they had improved over about a four-year window. Um, and that window completed in 2016, and they wanted to know, you know, what impact has this had? They didn't collect any baseline data, right? They didn't really have a deep understanding of what the communities around these road segments were like, right? but they wanted now to have some answers. Um, and so they asked us, okay, what, can we, what kind of data can we link to this? We have the engineers gave us the, the shape files, the geocoded data for with the roads, that was specifically the segments we improved, of, what can we link to this? And so one uh, thing that we naturally went to was nighttime lights. Okay. Now nighttime lights is uh, a, a data set that's provided, it's generated by the US Defense Department but it's then processed by NASA and NOAA and a variety of other agencies and provided as a public data set. Okay? And over this time period, provided on a monthly basis. So you'll have a measure of basically how bright this particular pixel was on average for this month. Okay? Now, the pixels here are about 750 meters wide by 750 meters wide, or long, right? And um, you might ask yourself, okay, why lights? What is that really telling us? Over the last 10 years, there have been a series of studies that have shown us that nighttime lights are highly correlated with all sorts of economic well-being and indicators. Those include GDP, but also they include things like child mortality and educational enrollments and outcomes. So we can think about these as very kind of broad measures of economic well-being. So what we did was take the roads, the road segments that were improved, and look at the nighttime lights over the time period on a on a month by month basis over the time period um, that the roads were improved, and look to see if immediately after the roads were completed, nighttime lights began to pick up disproportionately. And the great thing is because you have these at such fine levels, you can really make sure that you're comparing apples to apples. You can use a, a panel framework, if you will, and control for things that are specific to that particular pixel. Every pixel, you can have your own baseline, if you will, right, to make sure that pixels far from the roads are, are similar uh, to those that are, that are near the roads. Um, and here what we find is actually that these roads really did help. We find a pretty big effect that begins in the month after the completion and, and stays pretty stable. 
Um, and that really is focused on the one to two kilometers right around the roads. Um, in fact, it's focused really on small towns. So rural areas we found relatively little effect, and in the major towns we saw relatively little effect. But in towns that were connected by these roads, newly connected by, by improved roads, we see a pretty big effect, again, from, from nighttime lights. So that's one kind of example uh, in, in the roads and infrastructure sector. A second example comes from the health sector, a very different setting. Here's the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Okay. The World Bank and a variety of other donors, the Global Fund, lots of other donors, poured in about $500 million um, in the early two, two, 2010s um, to fund bed net distribution uh, to combat malaria in the DRC. They did this by rolling out campaigns province by province over time. Okay. Um, we also have demographic and health surveys from the DRC, both before and after these took place. And the demographic and health surveys, one of the nice things about them is that they are geocoded. So we know the location, at least um, after they protect the anonymity of the respondents, to pretty precise um, uh, coordinates. And we can say, okay, this, this spot, um, you know, this, we, we see mortality being here in 2007 and be, being here in uh, 2013, 14, and, and being here later on. But the other important thing is that we can also link it to climate data. And the climate data will tell us a lot about what the prevalence of malaria transmission is likely to be in a given year. And while malaria prevalence is high all across the DRC, in some hotter and wetter years, it's, high, it's higher. And just as importantly, in some parts of the DRC, it ends up being higher in hotter and wetter periods than it is in cooler and drier periods in other parts of the DRC. So this lets us test not just how effective were these bed nets on average, but did the bed nets have disproportionate effects exactly in those worst conditions? Or uh, were those worst conditions such high prevalence loads that even the bed nets couldn't protect them, right? This is actually kind of a technical question when you get down to the nuts and bolts of how the bed nets prevent mosquitoes from actually biting humans. And what we find in this case is that it's exactly what you would hope for. The bed nets are most protective under the worst conditions. Um, and so that is a really important finding for the Global Fund, for example, to be able to target um, their supplies first, for example, based on things like climate models or like Mohammed was just showing us, early warning systems that say it's going to be a particularly bad year for malaria in this part of the country. So that's kind of another um, twist on, on geospatial impact evaluation that lets you do this within country targeting. Um, from a within country view, you can also often zoom way out to a global view. Okay. So this is the World Bank's investments in the environmental sector over roughly a 15-year window. And as we've been talking about, we geocoded these projects. And because there are so many of them and they take place in such different areas, we could begin to unpack the kinds of locations in which they have positive effects or negative effects in some cases. And what we might think about here is deforestation outcomes or biodiversity outcomes or lots of other outcomes that are tracked, again, geospatially. Some from satellites and some from surveys and in situ collection. And what you can find is that even within the same country, again, if you go to the DRC or if you go to South America, within the same country, you can find spots where the effects are positive and spots where the effects are negative. Um, so, for example, each of these spots is um, an, a location where a project took place, and we're comparing that project to other nearby locations where no project took place. And we're looking for green spots where the effects are positive and red spots where the effects are negative. Right? And so, again, you can see lots of green and red often very nearby to one another which is telling you that the locations that you're putting that project really does make a difference. Okay. This is something, again, that you can do um, when you have a wide panel, right? When you've got this kind of uh, data on a variety of investments located in lots of different places. And then the cool thing is you can build a portal. This portal's still live if you'd like to look at it. You can build a portal to go in and look at those individual cases and say, what's going on here? Um, the last example I'll show you is also from the environmental sector, but it's tied to land tenure. Um, 
This is a World Bank again and KFW, German KFW funded project that took place between 1995 and 2008. Um, and it was meant to improve the land tenure protections for over 100 indigenous communities in the heart of the Amazon. Um, and uh, you could see the communities here uh, uh, geocoded. Um, this is a good case of going way back in time to try to find some geocoded data. Okay. KFW contracted a data to, to try to figure this out. And it turned out that this set of data was actually sitting in an access database in Sao Paulo and hadn't been touched in 10 years. Right? But it only took, you know, getting it off that hard drive and then comparing it, for example, to satellite data on deforestation. And what you could begin to see then was that, in fact, the communities that were protected actually had very similar deforestation patterns to communities that weren't protected. Now, this was a little disappointing to KFW, and they said, you know, our hope was that we had helped. Uh, and so they said, okay, well, what about conflict in these communities? Had conflict gone down? And it turned out that, in fact, the conflict had gone down somewhat. But it also turned out that they had motivated their project targeting based on the threat of deforestation, which in 1995 was not very well understood. So this is a good case of a donor kind of recalibrating, going back and understanding what they could and couldn't do at the time and saying, what can we do now? Right? Can we use better data to, in fact, direct our scarce resources to protect the communities that are most at risk in the next few years? Okay, so these are kind of flavors of geospatial impact evaluation. Let me kind of, again, take you behind the scenes and show you what you actually need to be able to do a geospatial impact evaluation. Some of this Anne Sophie already mentioned, but you need good spatial information on where the program took place and when it took place at those locations. And then you, of course, want to merge it with high resolution, time varying outcome data. Um, this can be increasingly survey data, like the demographic and health surveys that I mentioned before, living standards measurement surveys increasingly are georeferenced. Lots of remote sense data, including uh, data on all sorts of things which you might not even um, be believe uh, satellites can pick up. Um, there's lots of event data, so conflict data generated um, uh, here and, and elsewhere that's geocoded um, and some other administrative data. And then one other thing that we hadn't really talked about yet was it's not just a matter of mashing up these two data sets and saying, okay, what does this give me? You actually have to be a little bit more careful because geospatial data has its own set of statistical issues. Um, some of those have to do with the way that things just are correlated over space. So they tend to be spatially correlated. We kind of get clustering and that presents some problems. And often what we want to do is find kind of matching comparison units out there. We, we'll say, okay, well, these areas were treated. Let's go out and find some comparable non-treated units. Um, when we do kind of the simple matching exercises without thinking spatially, what we'll tend to do is find very close matching units. So we'll get our comparison units that are right near the treated units. But if there's any spillovers that are happening, either positive or negative, those comparison units will then be biased. Right? So we want to be a little bit more careful, for example, with these types of things. Um, as we said, Aid Data has geocoded um, lots of different donors, thanks, and um, lots of different locations around the world. Um, in many cases, we've coded from lots of different types of sources as well. So sometimes it's PDFs. For example, that World Bank data set that I was describing to you involved students reading the pads, the, the Annex 6 of the project appraisal documents. Right? That they're bored to tears, um, you know, for an entire summer, but we have them do it and collect that data. For example, the Global Environmental Facility, where we've just geocoded all of their sustainable land management, they had all of their data, uh, data, you know, PDFs in folders right, that we have students comb through. Another model is sending a fellow to a country to actually go door to door, donor by donor, collecting locational information from spreadsheets and piecing it together. In some cases, there are actually donor management systems that 
have this information already in them. That's great, but rare. And then for some donors that don't actually report this themselves, like China, we use media and other third-party um, sources to, to collect that data, right? So we have um, database aggregators combing for news reports about Chinese activities, for example, in Malawi or Tanzania, and then students read those news reports and geocode them from, from those news reports. And then some other things that we're increasingly doing is not just these kind of points that you're seeing on the map, but actually linear infrastructure. So where was that road taking place, right? Um, or where is that new power line that's going in? Where's the irrigation canals, right? We want to think about them as lines. And then even better, polygons, like those community boundaries that I showed to you before, right? Those are much richer sets of data that we could use for impact evaluation. These are kind of new and better ways to geocode. They take a little bit more effort. This is what geocoding, for example, a linear piece of infrastructure, like an irrigation canal in, Tan in sorry, Afghanistan might look like. We have students actually right, coding the individual pieces um, and a variety of kind of uh, toolkits that we've built out for this. Last couple things for you. Uh, we used to think satellites were just really good at measuring things like forests and lights. Um, it turns out the satellites can do a reasonably good job of actually measuring wealth and consumption and poverty as well. Um, so as part of our uh, efforts, we um, re-granted some funding to a team at Stanford to correlate the um, uh, satellite imagery from daytime images with household poverty measures from these demographic and health surveys and living standards measurement surveys. And it turns out that the satellites can do a reasonably good job of this. Um, so here's the um, data, for example, for five countries um, that pick out poor and, and less poor areas within these countries. Um, and you have to have a ton of data to do this and you have to use a machine learning like an, um, artificial intelligence algorithm to, to, go, to cope with all that data, but it's very feasible. So increasingly we are now doing evaluations where we look at consumption or poverty as the outcome measured from space. Um, okay, very last thing I'll tell you about. If you really were bored to tears by everything that I've just said, and you really don't want to know about matching, and you really don't want to know about um, dealing with all the statistical stuff, we've also built a portal for you. Okay? Um, it's just geo.adata.org or, or geo.adata.wm.edu. It lets you just go to the country that you're working on, say, again, Afghanistan, and say you just want to focus on the districts of Afghanistan. So you pick the districts, Afghanistan districts, and then it lets you pick whatever data you want from whatever years you want and whatever donors you want. For example, um, we have geocoded donor data from Afghanistan, so you can go in and pick um, CETA or you can pick other donors. Thanks. Um, pick the sectors that you're interested, the years, and what it'll give you back is a table, right? Not a map, not like any of the crazy stuff we've been talking about. A table in Excel that you can open and say it was higher in this year or lower in this year. By the way, it'll also let you pick lots of outcome data. So it'll let you pick the nighttime lights data that we've been talking about, the child mortality data, um, land cover, precipitation, lots of other stuff. Um, and just play with it kind of in, in the, your own favorite, um, you know, uh, Excel or, or statistical software of interest. Um, we're constantly adding data sets to this. So if you have requests, suggestions of data sets, we're happy to entertain them. We're trying to start with global scale or wide scale data that will be useful to lots of folks and increasing both the sectors um, that we're working on and the, the depth in which it'll go into in each sector. Um, I think I'll skip the rest of these are kind of all ways to deal with the geospatial data if you don't want to do what I just showed you and instead want to go go way into it. Um, there are lots of limitations that I think Anne Sophie mentioned most of them, but um, I should say that they are, you know, we're we're constantly breaking down those limitations. So um, I wouldn't stick to, to this if I were presenting this next year, I probably wouldn't stick to the same slide, for example. Okay. Let me quit there and uh, I'm sure we'll have some further conversation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Well, thank you for providing us with such vivid illustrations of how you can use the geocoded data. 
Um, of course, I'm, I'm sure that all of you and myself, I mean, we have a number of issues and questions. Um, but I think, I mean, this has given us food for thought, but I think we should now also turn to real food. And uh, in fact, um, there will be sandwiches. We thought it would be brought here, uh, but it's not. So you will have to go down the stairs and uh, grab your sandwich and your salad and the drink and immediately rush up here so that we can, co can continue the seminar. Okay, thank you. So let's uh, continue uh, our seminar. Um, and we now have, uh, we'll have two uh, commentators. Uh, it, was, it is Maria Halderson from uh, Statistics Sweden. And uh, Maria has been involved in statistics and international cooperation for a long time. And I know you're also involved in, uh, uh, on a UN level, uh, in sort of a technical committee uh, dealing with, with uh, using geocoded uh, data, and also at European uh, level. So we're very interested in hearing your comments. Okay. Uh, and then we'll have Carl Elmstam, uh, and your transparency manager here at CEDA, which means that in case you wonder anything about the data being published in open aid, you better talk to Carl. Okay. Okay, Please, so do I have to press something or can you hear me? No. You can hear me? Good. So uh, thank you very much for inviting me and taking part in this uh, interesting seminar. I've, for sure, I've learned a lot <laughs> for the last hour. So. Um, uh, just a bit more on my, my background, I, I'm a director at Statistics Sweden, responsible for regions and environment statistics. And in that capacity, I'm also um, co-chairing this working group on your spatial information linked to the UN Interagency and Expert Group on sustain Sustainable Development Goal Indicators. Uh, and we had a meeting last week and talked about exactly these issues local data, how do you find them, how can we build capacity in the countries to be able to report on the 2030 agenda. So, very timely. Um, I'm also, since this summer, responsible for our international cooperation work. And uh, so, you might know that Statistics Sweden, we are very active in international cooperation and we have uh, some 10 projects going on where we have long-term consultants uh, situated in the countries and uh, we do a lot of short-term missions uh, bringing our expertise uh, to these countries. So coming from that perspective, I, I would just like to share with you some thoughts on these three very interesting presentations. Um, I'm all, always curious to know where do you actually find the data? Where do you find the data? And we've had some very good examples here, but I would like to, to make it a bit more <laughs> problematic, or, or if I can put it that way. Because uh, no doubt uh, what we've been shown, it's, it will be a huge benefit to have uh, geocoded aid data, that's for sure, so no dispute about that. But when you want to start to link your geocoded aid data with, well, which were the results? What can we see? How can we follow up? Uh, did we get the, the outcome and the output that we were looking for? Then I'm a bit more, well, uh, I think we really need to look into the basics, the foundations in the countries that are um, receiving aid. Because at least from, from my knowledge, you know, you have these surveys going on, but then you often have a problem with the sample sizes. So if you want to really track down and go on a very detailed level, perhaps you will only find a very few respondents there. And are they really uh, reliable, so to speak? Can you, can you draw a lot of conclusions just coming from a few respondents? Uh, then you have the census and um, the census is very good, it's very detailed. Uh, countries do censuses, but often they only do them every 10 years. So then you have the problem with the, the timeliness. You, don't, you will not find 
timely data on a very detailed level for, for many of the uh, developing countries. And then, last but not least, of course, we have the Earth observations and we have uh, population grids and stuff like that, and they are really wonderful. They, they can be very, very useful, and we had some very nice examples of that. Uh, so, for projects dealing with agriculture, infrastructure, and so there, I think there is a large poten potential in using that kind of data sources. Um, but if if the knowledge is good in uh, countries on how to, to conduct surveys on a national basis, how to conduct censuses, then when it comes to the use of new data sources, there might be also some, something for us to think about. How can we capacitate and how can we um, make countries use more of these new data sources themselves? Uh, because my point is that even if it's wonderful to have all these global data sources, I would really like to see a movement also to um, empower the countries themselves. They should have an infrastructure of statistics that is really uh, reliable. If you want to know something about a country, you should go to the National Statistical Organization and look for what do they have? What do they make available in their, their uh, data, databases? So that's really the goal. Uh, and that's also uh, something we talked about last week. You know, this uh, very nice um, overarching principle of leaving no one behind. Okay, if we talk about leaving no one behind and we think about leaving no, no one behind, uh, when it comes to location, um, then often... Uh, it's talked about, well, you can disaggregate your data. You can, you can use uh, samples, you can use surveys, and then you can disaggregate your data to talk about what's happening in a specific spot. But uh, I think we should actually have the opposite approach. We should have the bottom-up approach and um, starting to use more uh, administrative sources, starting to use more more earth observations, more geospatial in situ da data to, to be able to build your data from, from the bottom up. And that's also very important when it comes to national policy, I think, to, if you want to target something from a national perspective and a policy perspective, then you need to know that there will be data, there will be something that we can use when following up what we are doing. Okay, um, but uh, well, listening to all three of you, I'm I'm really very hopeful. I think this is a very good path, and uh, we will surely see much more use of all kinds of both global and national data sources in the years to come. So, uh, what I will do when I get back to my office is look more closely into a data and what you were showing for Somalia. I think it was such an inspiring example. So. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, so my name is Carl Amstam and I work at SIDA's uh, uh, unit for communication. And uh, I have been working with our open data and the website openaid.se since around 2011. And I guess in this discussion, my viewpoint is very much from the data publisher perspective. Um, and, and CEDA and Sweden was early to publish open data on aid. Um, but I would like to make the distinction between publishing open data and showing it on a portal like openaid.se, uh, because I think in, in this discussion it's important to also talk about the actual raw data that we publish, and that we publish according to an international standard called the IATI standard, which is the uh, International Aid Transparency Initiative. And uh, the IATI standard now has over 600 publishers, so it's, it's sort of the de facto global standard for, for aid projects. Um, and, and since a few years back, I struggle to remember if it was 2013 or 14, when it had good support for geocoding your, your project data. Uh, and we have been thinking about and planning to do geocoding of our projects for yeah, three or four years, but it was only during last year that we started to get good 
support from our internal systems to, to, to sort of enable us to do that. And we're working our way through the backlog actually uh, now to be able to start doing that. So, th so this the report comes very timely for us because we're just now planning for next year's activities and uh, I think it's a really good input. We might, you know, come back to you on that. Um, so so that, that, that's, that's very good. And we have been looking before on methods uh, for inputting and we're actually not decided yet on how to do it, but we do hope that we will be able to use machine learning and automatic suggestions at least for geocoding and so on. So on a, on a, we're, we're planning it on a practical level, but we have not yet implemented it. Um, and I would also like to talk a little bit about uh, visualization, because we have had both on OpenAid and in our open data, uh, we have had sort of tiny bits of sub-national uh, geographical information before, but what we've mostly had is, like was mentioned before, we've had the information whether which country a project is taking place in or a region or on a global level. And <clears throat> it can be challenging to actually visualize that. And in the first version of OpenAid, we had bubbles, a bubble for each country and region. And the size of the bubble would, if, it's, if it was a small bubble, it would indicate that it was a small amount of money being used there. And a large bubble would indicate a large, larger amount of money. But what we did also have was a huge bubble in the middle of the Atlantic, uh, which would be global projects and projects that couldn't be um, connected to, to a single project. For example, uh, the multilateral core support. And I think that it's really important to, to, to keep that in mind when visualizing because um, geocoding can sort of give you a, it can give a false image that, that aid is spent in places, uh, but you're only showing a small portion of aid. Also, um, yeah, I would like to agree, it's been extremely interesting to listen to the speakers here today. Uh, and I'm personally very much looking forward uh, to when our project, geocoded project data, can be mashed up and analyzed together with satellite imagery and so on. It's, it's actually really cool stuff, I think. Um, and, but I think that, I mean, the aid, the aid effectiveness aspect is, of course, central to us. And I think one of the main reasons that we have had geocoding as high up as we have had in our backlog is, is that we constantly hear through our, our discussions within the IATI community that the, the partner countries, they're actually, they're asking for this again and again. So it's, there, is a, there is a big interest in having geocoded data from the partner countries. And uh, I think that the, it was good that the, the report also uh, talks about the aspect that partner country systems can sort of collect and unite uh, geocoded data as well. Uh, I haven't really thought about it that much, uh, but, but it's an interesting, interesting aspect of it, I think. And there are also a couple of other things that I would like to mention in relation to IATI. As I said before, there are over 600 publishers now, and maybe around 100 of those are larger organizations or countries. But the growing majority of organizations using this common standard uh, are, are CSOs and the smaller organization implementers. And, the, and a central idea with IATI is that you should be able to sort of follow the, the chain uh, in development um, so that our projects would be linked to smaller and smaller projects down to the actual local implementing organization. And I think that uh, <clears throat> it's really interesting to consider that in some cases where we probably would never be able to geocode a project, a large project from our perspective, but once it gets divided in, up into smaller pieces, those organizations further down the chain will be able to geocode. Uh, and I think that's a, it's, it's a interesting um, and has, has a lot of potential to, to actually give us a lot more geodata in, in the coming years. And of course, when speaking of IATI, I should say that as soon as we have a geocoding that we're happy with, we will, uh, we will actually go to the IATI meetings and brag about it to inspire others uh, to do the same. Um, and, and hopefully in, in a year or, or two, we should be able to have progress a lot. Um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much <laughs> what I had to say. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, um, also Swedish aid is going to be geocoded eventually, yeah, yeah. quite soon. Um, so, thank you very much for your comments. Uh, well, I'll, well, please stay, Maria. <laughs> so, I'll now invite the presenters, Anne-Sophie and uh, 
uh, Ariel and uh, Mohammed, and we'll try to arrange ourselves here in some way. <laughs> And first, um, I'd like to uh, give you the opportunity to respond uh, to the comments uh, from uh, Maria and Kalle. Uh, just a brief round of, uh, of, of, of response. And uh, then uh, we'll invite uh, the audience uh, to uh, make your interventions. Okay, so please. So, Al-Sophie, do you want to uh, start? Yeah, I can you not, uh, um... I mean, you feel free to also comment on your fellow presenters' uh, <laughs> work. <laughs> yeah, I, I could start by doing that, actually. It was very interesting to have like a broad spectrum of the applications and the great examples. And yeah, it was, it was, it was great. Um, and thank you for good uh, comments. Um, so, uh, sample sizes at the very local level, yeah. That's a concern. <laughs> if you look at survey data, of course. But I, but I guess what, what you can do is, I guess, um, compare results from using the very local level to aggregate aggregated upper level and look at the district level. And because I guess many of these surveys are, they claim to be representative to the province or district level or something like that, and it's not necessarily at the say village level. So so you need to be careful when interpreting the results. So you don't have the same kind of issues using satellite data, of course. But yeah, that's. Okay then. <laughs> um, so yes, that's the, the that's the main point, I guess, from I took from you there. Uh, it would also be very interesting to see what is actually done at uh, at Statistics uh, Sweden and uh, uh, where you have you know your statistical consultants and, and what's been going on on the ground. And I think there's room for collaboration, I think, with the with the researchers here as well. So, yeah, I will surely look into that. Um, uh, from Carl, um, that, that it can create a false image uh, on, on, uh, on, on covering all types of aid. Yeah, um, I think you need to be careful and I try to I try to be that in my presentation as well that it refers to you know um, specific types of interventions are suitable for these kinds of methods others are are not and I think also that a data is is very transparent with this they have these uh, eight different categories sort of uh, on, on, on the precision of the jail codes and um, going from eight way from one where you have a very precise geo code to eight where it's like Basically, the national levels are not informative, really, about anything much. So maybe basically the, the bubble in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean would kind of capture that. But anyway, so, so when you do this type of analysis, I, I think most people using this data actually focus on, 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 uh, on the um, geocoded projects in, in precision category of like one and two that are measured very precisely. But you need to remember that when you actually get to the conclusions of, of your study, right? So you don't like draw broad conclusions about aid in general. Or so, so make clear that it's about these clearly defined uh, defined projects with the clear, clearly defined project, uh, project sites. Yeah, so it's an important point. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you for the great comments, and these are really a cool mix of presentations. Um, on, on that issue of, you know, when we have projects that we sometimes don't know, don't have enough information to say this is the coordinates, but we know they're in this district or in this province, um, that is a constant challenge, and, and researchers have in the past basically ignored a, a large swath of, of projects. That is something that we've now developed a methodology to deal with that um, looks at the uncertainty, if you will, in the actual geo codes, the coordinates themselves, and says, okay, how much can we tease out of this um, by simulating it? And that's, there's a, now a package that's written in R that's on our site as well. Um, but that's a great point that we have this kind of mixture of, of uh, types of projects with, and aggregates. Um, I think on the question of whether to do kind of more work through partner country systems as opposed to donor systems. Um, to be honest, we have found that the donor system quality of data is substantially higher than virtually anything we can get out of partner country systems, at least 
countrywide systems. So often these are what we call these aid information management systems. Um, we've now geocoded uh, probably about 25 of them. Um, they are notoriously difficult to get complete data for, and um, it is some of the data that we have the biggest problems with. Um, that being said, individual projects often have amazing databases within countries. So some of our best projects, we did not get necessarily data from the donor side. We got it from, well, not donor HQ at least. We got it from the donor office in the country because they had kept uh, you know, this amazing database that uh, you know, had been probably languishing, underutilized in, in a variety of cases. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, and then lastly, I think on the small sample size issue, um, Anne Sophie is entirely right, the satellites give us this incredibly large sample size. It's not a sample, they give us the entire country, right? But the problem is, of course, that they're proxies. And so joining the satellite imagery together with sample surveys that you can train and correlate sufficiently well is in some ways like the holy grail because you can have effectively between census nationwide poverty estimates down to the village level, right? I mean, that is, that would be an amazing treasure trove that you could have an annual time series village by village, what's the poverty head count or what's the poverty share. Um, but, you know, we're not quite there yet, but, but it's, it's coming. I mean, I, I suspect it will be two or three years. Um, so anyway, that's, that's just yet, yet another advertisement. <laughs> okay, Mohammed, yeah, I will just uh, make, make brief comment. It was amazing to hear your presentation as well on how we, our project could fit in. Uh, from the uh, research side, you showed how your coded data is important, and I believe as well that it's much important. That what we could see when we were collecting data, it was uh, geocoded now. Then uh, in the next step is to use it to show uh, policymakers uh, you need to invest in this area. There was a lot of lack of water, for example. Otherwise, if we didn't have the geocoded data, we couldn't do that. So that's the important. And, um, and it will be much easier for, uh, for you guys if you have this data to improve and make sure. And one other comment I want to suggest is, I believe as you, every country should have data that's open for everyone that will have more quality on it. So otherwise, if you have uh, uh, private sector or individuals, there was always on their agendas well, they collect this data. So you, have, you need to have Prada expecto. So that's a great thing. Uh, uh, about the satellite, we were hoping uh, the next step for improving our platform was through satellite imagery, that we could see how the green areas look like or how the water looks like, uh, so we could map easier when people call. The things that happened during the drought was like, there was a lack of water in one area, so the nomadic people could take their animals and go into wrong direction instead if they could call us and then we could see through subtle images where water is, is we could uh, coordinate and tell them take that direction instead. So the possibility is uh, wide. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so uh, I'm sure you're brimming with uh, questions, issues. <laughs> okay. So, thank you. Um, I don't know your name, but uh, yeah. well, will you please, please just identify yourself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Thomas from the German uh, Institute for Development Evaluation. Um, thank you very much for the reports, and I think um, they really, uh, the, or the two reports and the project, uh, they are really setting the benchmark, I would say, for combining policy relevance on the one hand and cutting edge research on the other hand. So I learned a lot, thank you for that. Um, my question is about, um, it's a bit methodological maybe. Um, <clears throat> so um, usually uh, there are different techniques to um, correct for spillover effects uh, on one side, to correct for spatial imprecision on the other side. And sometimes I get the feeling that while digging deep in and getting ever more precise, we are um, 
maybe um, losing sight of phenomena that are by definition spatially extensive, so which are emergent, for instance, political systems or something like that, which might not be, uh, which we might not be able to disaggregate because it doesn't make sense in the end. So um, my question is, how can we, um, uh, how can we make sure that we, um, that we take into account the specific level a phenomenon resides on, so to say, in our estimation of the effects and not to lose sight of those old variables, uh, we might call them. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes, this is a, a technical question, to be sure. Uh, would you like to I would to say that, that, you know, uh, it comes down to, to the person utilizing the method to be careful, I guess, and to think about these issues and to think about what is the sensible level with which this particular theoretical mechanism or, or, or whatever we're after, it operates on. So, so I guess in the end it's uh, about being careful in your analysis, so uh, I don't know if that's a good answer. Do you have any? <laughs> no, I mean, I think there is not, this is by no means a substitute for, you know, thoughtful unit of, <laughs> unit of analysis uh, selection. Uh, and it is a well-known challenge Oh, yes, sorry. It is a well-known challenge in, in geography and GIS that there's this modifiable area unit problem. If you look at things in, at the micro scale, they go one way. If you look at them on a more macro scale, they point entirely the opposite way. Um, I think that, that very much still exists. Um, the, the important thing, of course, though, is that with micro data, you can always aggregate up. Right, so you can replicate your results if you, if you truly believe the mechanism is different at a more aggregate scale. You can aggregate the data and look at what happens at the district or province level. You can't, if you don't have the disaggregated data, you can't go down. Right, you're just stuck at that one level. Um, and so that's, I, I think, the, the kind of advantage of, of being able to do that. In fact, you can, I think, test some really interesting theories by varying the unit of analysis and getting some potentially different answers. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, what, Verena? <laughs> Thanks, it's really inspiring. I'm so happy I have a few hours this afternoon where I can go and check out your portal. Um, five small points. I recently came back from Tanzania, so it's a lot from the sort of partner country perspective. First, I think it's, it's um, I'm very happy um, to see the maps. I think for any data to get used and to actually contribute tr to transparency and increased use and better analysis and so on, it needs to be visual. So maps, of course, is one way, but there's other things. And I would like to see a combination with other visualization features to make it more interactive. Um, I think we still need to work on um, better quality of the, of the aid data. We've had a lot of problems with this sort of Reporting is difficult, cumbersome, and so on. So I think we need to work on, on the tools for reporting so that, that the quality of the data gets better and we have fewer of those unspecified and unallocated and whatever categories. Um, third is, I, I think um, Kali also mentioned it, there's more, um, we need to get more actors in. From the country perspective, this gets more interesting the more actors actually geocode their data. So, so initiatives like supporting CSOs to... Um, both um, reported to according to IIT standard, but also geocode is, is um, much needed. Fourth, um, I think we also need to combine more data. For example, the Tanzania example with social security, I would have immediately wanted to see how that then impacts uh, school enrollment and so on, and the data is, is there, at least at district level disaggregation. But so I, I really think a close collaboration with the statistical offices um, is very important and support for them to, to produce data um, more regularly and at a better level because then it's exponential. The more layers you can overlay, the, the more interesting it becomes. And finally, of course, Agenda 2030, which calls for a lot of data and a lot of monitoring, is, is an opportunity, I think, to support countries, to empower countries, as you said, to, to have their own data portals and to make use of, of this technology and, and of all the data. Thanks. Okay, thank you. You didn't have any particular question, did you? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, it's up to you. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Tobias Edman, and I'm from the Geographic Information Bureau, and I work with uh, geographical analysis and remote sensing. 
So I'm really happy that you had this uh, seminar and to see the great results that was made. And from my perspective, <clears throat> I would say that working with non-spatial data would be like running with a blindfold. So I really don't understand how to do it. But I was talking to Sida like 2010, 2011, and we were discussing this, how to year code the data and how to use spatial analysis to evaluate uh, <clears throat> the aid. And then the answer was that, no, it's not for us, actually. It must be up to the partner countries. They must ask for it. So it was quite a low maturity, I would say, to see the potential of uh, year analysis. So I wonder now, I mean, we've seen some really great examples. What is the maturity in the donor society today to actually see that this is something that we can use and that we need to use to achieve our goals? Okay, thank you. So. <laughs> thank you, my name is Johan Holm. Uh, I it, very much but I was particularly interested in the references to the work of Statistics Sweden. I'm just working on an evaluation of one of the projects of Statistics Sweden. These are capacity building projects. You're raising the capacity of a statistical institution in a poor country. So the outcomes are qualitative. Now how do you use your this kind of data to assess qualitative data? All the outcomes in the project like are measured in terms of people's knowledge. Do you use proxies for the work that they do? Is that how you could go about it? Thank you. Okay, wait. Was that, that directed to mm. me? <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that was a difficult question. No, <laughs> I, I'm happy to yeah. say something. Or yeah. Do we collect a few questions <clears throat> first? Yes, okay. Uh, no. So who else? Oh. Okay, yes, please go ahead. Hi, my name is Asif. I'm a fellow of the UNDESA, New York, and uh, always you do a very nice event, nice job. I like the presentation of uh, the South Africa you are doing really good. Is it you using the Google APIs or you using the other ones? No, we use uh, open, uh, open Map. Okay, Open Map. The lady, Yotoberi, very good presentation. Now I'm going to come to the technical part with the US person. Uh, very good presentation and the Swedish guys, uh, expert Carl and the other ones. We are using AIs and machine learning in Africa using drones, so we collect the data from the drone, drones and then we feed them into the geo information system for physical infrastructure with the limitation of the UN projects. We can discuss that. I want to have a clear of the US and the Swedish guys, how are we going to use the AI machine learning and geospatial analysis in terms of the blockchain because when we designed the sustainable development goal, it was going to shift from the databases to the blockchains. So any information, how we, are you planning to do any strategies or technical things that you have in mind and what you look forward to see, any regulations you would like to have or support or anything? Okay. Uh -huh. Well, I think that that question was a little bit beyond me, but <laughs> I think it was very technical, uh, and um, so I'll. Leave I'm happy it to, to you to react. <clears throat> yeah, to I'm happy to try and answer a little bit of that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, for us, I mean, we we very much focus on the fact that we are using IATI, which is a global standard, and and I do know that uh, IATI, that the IATI technical team has been sort of evaluating if blockchain technology could be used in the IATI setting. Uh, but I also think that there might be some challenges. Um, for example, that have to do with, with security. If a situation in the country changes and we would want to remove information, if that information, I mean the database, which is not a database, uh, <laughs> would be distributed, it would be problematic. So I think that uh, donors are likely to want to, you know, maintain their, their, their ownership of, of publishing their own data. But, but in a sense, I think that IATI has already, is already a step beyond the traditional, more traditional databases. Not, not sure if it answers your question no, or not. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, I think Sweden, I think, with the Google and the IBM, so we have special interest in something, but, but the stats, as the lady said, because the donor funding is, is a big question, because a person invests, a donor will make invest, and it goes up after five years, they are investing in the same region, same project. It's like project after project, where in the blockchain we know 
what's happening and how and why we're not getting impact, why it's always weird. So blockchain gives more transparency. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> if I try to say something on uh, the qualitative aspects, so yes, uh, you're perfectly right. When we build capacity, of course, it's to do with capacitating a country to produce better national accounts or better price statistics or better uh, vital statistics on the population or a health survey or, or whatever. So. So that, of course, is very difficult to have some sort of geospatial aspect on. So the geospatial aspect, as I see it, it comes in the, in the output, their statistical output, to have that uh, more geospatial accurate and to think about the geospatial aspects when we set up sort of a, a new survey or, or help them to um, start using more registers because then you have it by default if you are able to access tax registration or um, other data sources and start using them then you will find yourself with a whole a lot uh, new possibilities to to have your data geocoded and and right to a very detailed level uh, but i'm not so sure that we really measure this uh, now, because uh, we don't have that aspect so visible in our projects. So perhaps that's something for us to think about, how to um, talk about this with our countries and finding out, are you interested in increasing your capacity also when it comes to the geospatial aspects? And then link it also to the 2030 agenda and what do you want to do? How, how are you supposed to to uh, work on leaving no one behind if you don't know where they are. So, so um, yeah, very important point. Thank you. Okay, are we all sort of silent in awe? No. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Can everyone hear me? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Stefan Döring. I'm from Uppsala University. Um, so just two, two thoughts. I thought something that you haven't talked about at all is sort of issues of privacy and security. So I'm especially thinking about real-time data and when we talk about cell phone use or things like that and some of the countries that are uh, covered here are part of them are very repress repressive regimes and how do you make sure that you also, I mean, like um, keep the safe or make sure people are safe or not like the data is with, withhold maybe for a specific period because for security reasons, for example. Um, then a uh, the second question that I had was also for Mohammed, just a small technical question. I wondered sort of do you, how do you triangulate sort of the, the, the quality of the, the information that you get or like sort of the accuracy of the information? And um, yeah, I think that's it. I forgot my third question. <laughs> okay, thank you. Also, so, I think we forgot about a question towards the back about the maturity uh, <laughs> to see the benefits of uh, yes. the coded data. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting to see, to hear that you've been here like several years ago, and I think now there seems to be a lot of like curiosity and things happening. So, Mike, Mike, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, but then again, I mean, it's um, uh, this data is can be seen like uh, seen as a public good, so it's always an issue of who should kind of do the work. And uh, we've also had some discussions of shouldn't this be done by the by the uh, partner countries themselves, also from an ownership perspective and so on. So um, I think there are important issues to think about in term in terms of ownership. But I don't think I think there are actually need there's need for joint efforts and, and actually um, uh, not using ownership as kind of an argument not to <laughs> not to involve yourself in, in the work, so to speak. And I think uh, it seems to be like, happening stuff now, so yeah. yeah. Maybe what you said like 10 years ago has kind of set the ball, ball in motion, who knows? <laughs> yeah, I'd be happy to comment on that as well. Um, I, I think that <clears throat> when... when um, donor agencies first saw the sort of total list of stuff that you were supposed to report through IATI, I think for several of them, geocoding seemed to be one of the more 
weird and new ones, uh, perhaps comparable to um, the request for translating old project titles and descriptions into the local language, kind of got <laughs> bundled into those, which were seen as really large challenges because we hadn't been asked to report on them before. It's much, much easier to focus on the stuff that we were already reporting through the OECD DAC or, or some other system. Um, but I think it's really, I mean, I think it's really important that, for example, this um, this report to talks about how it can actually help us in, in, in developing aid to become more effective. That then it obviously becomes, in, I mean, I, I mentioned before that partner countries are, are, are as asking for it, but this also can show people uh, that we can use it ourselves to our own benefit, so to speak, within our own organization. So I think that it's it's growing and, and uh, the incentives to do it have, have increased a lot. But, but I mean, just a year or two ago, I, I would still sometimes hear from colleagues in other countries <laughs> that why would we do this? We, we, don't, we don't have any use for it. But, but I think that that has changed a lot in three or four years. Yeah. I will just say one other one other thing. Again, on the um, kind of donor level versus partner country level geocoding, um, you can answer very different questions with those two different types of geocoding, right? So if you're focusing in on one country or just a few countries at a time, that country scale or even the project within the country scale will get you the kind of aid effectiveness and targeting richness that you that you want. Um, but there is a different kind of learning that happens from the donor level learning, right? So all of the World Bank results that I showed you before about the environmental projects happening were different effects in this part as opposed to this other part of the world. You can't get that from individual country data sets, right? You have to do that as a donor and be willing to learn as a donor. So that's kind of, a, I would say, an ongoing challenge for, for donors who kind of had to balance that country ownership as opposed to headquarters-based kind of learning agenda. Um, on the privacy and confidentiality, I think the first thing is, again, to be sensible about your unit of analysis. Most of the data, for example, that I showed you on poverty and, and uh, forest cover, um, that is uh, n you know, not so fine that you would be able to identify individuals. Um, and we don't need that to be that fine. Um, there are other projects, maybe when you're looking at crop productivity or other things where you really want, you know, half a meter resolution or something else. Um, and then in those cases, you know, you have to take the extra precautions to protect those. And those, you know, those data aren't in blockchain and those data have to sit on secure servers. And there's kind of a whole list of other things which you have to do. But if you start out from the sensible question of can I measure this at a village aggregate level? Just can I get poverty at the village level? I don't need to identify this household as opposed to this household. Um, you can go an awfully long way, and, and all those data are already publicly available. They're provided already online. And so there's kind of that added security. Um, but I don't know, Mohammed, if you want to talk about your project. Yeah. I can add to, according to uh, security, about those who are reporting the information. We want to make sure when they report it before we publish, we verify the information first through some mechanism that we put. So there were at least five other people who are through our social network who needed to identify the, the, the source of information as true before we went up. And then we asked the, those who report to us if it's okay to publish their contact details. For most of the time, it was very important. It could be the village leader or someone who could then help to re reorganize at the place those who are conducting a response to the affected. Yeah, and then uh, so that's what we did. So, and there was a lot of areas that was unsecure, so we couldn't put uh, their names. There were so then the people who want to respond were needed to contact us, and afterward, if they were clean, then we could give them the contact. So that's our easy way. <laughs> okay. Yes. Better. Yeah. Okay. So just to add something also on the, the data protection side, uh, when it comes to statistics, I think it's very important to um, uh, regard input data as one thing and output data as another thing. Because if you collect your data on a very detailed level and, and you are actually able to pinpoint or geocode your data to a point, uh, an individual household or dwelling or whatever, 
Then, of course, when you release your data and, and you present it on maps or in a database or whatever, then you need to have all these precautions taken uh, with your disclosure control and you have to see, okay, on which area can, can I actually put out this data, not revealing anything about uh, someone specific because that would be a huge problem for, for the statistical organization if we think about fr from a country perspective. So you, you must all, always safeguard your data when it's out, but still within this safeguarded uh, so, sort of in-house in uh, treatment of the data, then you can allow yourself to, to work on really, really detailed level and have a flexibility on then when you release the data out, you can put it on a coastal zone, you can have it for a, a village, you can have it for a suburban area. So, so that's why it's so important to have sort of this bottom-up approach, I think. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think, well, in fact, time is almost up. <laughs> so I want you to join me in giving the presenters and the panel a big hand for elucidating us on the intricacies and possibilities of using geocoded data to understand aid and also development in general. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so, um, there is a new year coming, uh, and of course, EBA will continue to produce reports and organize interesting seminars like this one. Um, so, please uh, check our website, www.eba.se, and make sure that you're on the, on the list for, for receiving alerts uh, from us. Uh, please contact us if you have any great ideas for projects or things you think we should look at. Okay, thank you very much for attending. Thank you. Thank you.